Scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, one of Jesus' parables. Jesus told his friends a story. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. The landowner agreed to pay the workers for a full day's pay for a full day of work and sent the workers into his vineyard. About the middle of the morning, the landowner went out and saw other workers standing in the marketplace doing nothing. The landowner told the laborers, you also go and work in my vineyard. I will pay you whatever is right. So the workers went out. The landowner went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, the landowner went out and found still other laborers standing around. The landowner asked the laborers, why are you standing here doing nothing? The laborers answered, because no one's hired us. The landowner said to them, you go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his supervisor, call the workers, pay them their wages. Begin with the last ones hired and going on to the first ones hired. The workers who had hired, hired at five in the afternoon came. They each received a full day's pay. One hour of work, a full day's pay. So when the last workers came, the ones hired first, those laborers expected to receive more than a full day's pay. But each one of those workers also received a full day's pay. Full day work, full day of pay. When the full day laborers received their pay, they began to grumble. They said, these men who were hired last worked only one hour, and you have made those who worked only one hour equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But the landowner answered, Friends, I'm not being unfair to you. Did you not agree to work for a full day's pay? Take your pay and go. I want to give to the one who is hired last the same I gave you. Do I not have the right to do what I want with my own money? And here's the key word. Are you envious because I am generous? Are you envious because I am generous? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Am I envious because God has been as generous to other people as God has been to me? Sure I am. I've been full of envy since I was a child. The second deadly sin of envy has always infected my life. When as a child, I was always envious of the children who brought their lunches to school who got big cookies. As a teenager, I was envious of the boys who were taller than me. When I was in college, I envied the friends who dated beautiful women. When I was a young adult, I was envious of people who made more money. As a parent, I'm still envious when other people's children seem to be doing better than our children. As a pastor, I envy other pastors who seem to be serving more important congregations. I've always had enough food to eat, lived in a healthy house, had a good education. I've been blessed in many different ways, serve a great congregation. But I am green with envy. I want what others possess. 
The envy has damaged my soul. What about you? Are you envious because God has been as generous with other people as God has been with you? Sure you are. Despite all the belongings you have, the relationships you have, the experiences you have, when you look at other people and see what they have, you say, ooh, I'd like that. Envy is desiring something that belongs to someone else. It's not something we do. It's how we feel. It's how we think. We can envy other people's belongings. A car, a house, a piece of jewelry. We can envy people's characteristics, their relationships, their experiences. Through envy, we tend to magnify what other people have and minimize what we have. The Bible is full of envious people. Jacob envied his brother Esau's inheritance. Saul, the king, envied David when he slew Goliath because David became more popular. King David envied Uriah the Hittite, simply a soldier, because of his beautiful wife. Rachel envied Leah because Leah had more children. The followers of John the Baptist envied the followers of Jesus. The Pharisees envied Jesus because he was more popular than they were. The older brother was envious of his younger brother when he came home, having wasted the family money because his father gave him a big party. Peter and Paul envied each other, their power. In every case, God seemed to be more generous with somebody else than with us. Children's stories demonstrate the destructiveness of evil. Remember the story of Snow White. There is a queen who is beautiful and had power and ruled over an entire kingdom. But the queen asked every day, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? And when the mirror gave the right answer, the queen lost control. Snow White had only one thing the queen did not have. She was a young beauty. And because of that, the queen caused harm to Snow White and ended up destroying herself. Envy is not just something to children's stories. We find them in this place. Envy is something that lives in small towns, congregations, neighborhoods where everybody knows each other. We do not envy Warren Buffett, the billionaire, because we have no idea what Warren Buffett has. But we can envy the people who live down the street or who park beside us in the parking lot or work beside us. We tear down other people. We wish them to fail. Much of gossip comes from envying other people and trying to tear them down. Envy not only wants something that someone else has, it wants them to lose what they've already got. Envy also destroys our relationship with God. When we think that God has been more generous to another person than God has been to us, we become jealous of the other and angry at God. Why, God, did I not get those things, those qualities, those experiences, those relationships? Thomas Aquinas, theologian 500 years ago, wrote, Envy is the sorrow for another's good. 
sorrow about another's good. Invidia is the Latin word for envy. Invidia means loss of sight. We become blind to what God has given to us, and we magnify what God has given to others. We do not see how others may face their own challenges, their own difficulties. We only see what we want to see. We become blind to who we are, and we do not see the other appropriately. Jesus told a story about a group of envious workers. A master owned a vineyard. He needed people to work in it. He went out first thing in the morning and hired people to work in his field, in his vineyard. He went out again mid-morning, did the same thing. At noon, did the same thing. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the same thing. At 5 o'clock, with only an hour of light left, he hired another set of workers. At the end of the day, he gave all of them exactly the same payment, a full day's pay. The people who had worked all day grumbled. They complained. How dare you be generous with them? We are the ones who worked all day. And the master said, can you not rejoice that I'm being generous with everybody? In the medieval poet Dante, when he described what it's like to be in hell, he described the people who were envious, what would happen to them. What would happen to them is they would sew their eyelids shut. They can never again see what others possessed, and they can never again see what they possessed. They live out through eternity blind. I think that's a good illustration. So what's the alternative? Envy is part of who we are. The most natural, the most classic alternative is contentment. To be happy with who we are and what we have. To be at peace with who we are and what we are. Each of us possesses experiences and relationships and possessions that are different from everyone else. And there are others who envy us. Why can we not just relax and say, thank you, God, for making us who we are as we are. And be thankful about everybody else for who they are and their experiences and their expectations and what they should be. We should give thanks for who we are and, be thanks, and give thanks for what others have. We should rejoice when a friend gets a pay raise. Rejoice when someone else buys a new car or a bigger house. Rejoice when a child is born. Rejoice at a graduation. Re rejoice at an anniversary. We should rejoice when a flower, neighbor's flowers bloom. What a different world it would be if we are simply thankful for what we have and are thankful for what others around us also have. I think, however, at least for me, contentment is easier to speak about than to achieve. We find it difficult to say, I have enough. I need no more. One author wrote, and I thought it was really fairly clever, contentment means that you make more money than your brother or your sister. <laughs> as long as you're there, you're okay. There's another alternative to envy that I encourage you to think about, and that's imitation. Turning envy into a positive characteristic. When we see what someone else has, begin to model ourselves on them that we achieve the same things that they have. Let me give a couple of illustrations. The most obvious is how we live in our current economic situation. 
The whole basis of capitalism is based on seeing things that other people have and then working hard that we achieve what they have. The theory is if you see someone in a bigger house, if you work hard, you can buy a bigger house. Now, in these days, people are not so sure that system works anymore. The worst part of that problem is it tends to focus just on physical objects, on possessions, on things we can touch and grab. If that's the only thing we're after in this life, then we have sold our souls for material possessions. But it seems to me that if we want to improve our relationships with God, our relationship with other people, maybe what we need to do is start imitating people who seem to have gotten it right. We're in a world that's so full of celebrities, but we're also in a world that seems very short on heroes. What we should do is start trying to imitate, be envious, not the people we see on TV, but imitate the people we see around us who seem to have gotten the right answers. We need to be more faithful in following sinner, saints than sinners. Let me give you a couple personal illustrations. In my own life, I have often tried to imitate my father. My father, who's now been dead 10 years, was also a Methodist pastor and a theologian. And I've always envied what I saw in my father. He was generous with our family. He was very faithful to the church. And he tried constantly to improve how he communicated about God with other people. Because I was envious of what he had, I've tried to do the same things. I've tried to be as generous with my family as my father was with us. I've tried to do the same kind of things in the church I saw my father do. I've served on a number of the same committees my father served a generation before. And I constantly keep trying to say, how can I communicate the grace of God in better ways? What I tried to do was pick out somebody who I thought could be a mentor and try to model my life on his. We can do that in many spheres of our lives. I'm always envious of people who've had long marriages, of people who've been married to each other years and even decades, who seem to, even though the ups and downs of married life, still seem to be able to stay married to each other. I wonder what we would learn by talking to some of those people who have been married 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years and asking, how did you do it? Can we imitate you? Can we use our envy for what you have to teach us how to do the same for ourselves? One last illustration. I envy people who are faithful stewards of their financial possessions. I love telling the story about my wife, Sally, and how she taught me how to be a more faithful steward. When we were dating, I was always intrigued that Sally always seemed to manage her money very well. And she'll hate me telling the story, but it's okay. <laughs> when we were first married, I got my first paycheck serving my first congregation. It was $900 a month, about the salary of a starting school teacher. And I'd never gotten paid a salary that big. And when I deposited, I thought about all the things we could spend that money on. And what happened was Sally immediately got our checkbook and wrote a check to the church for $90 and then $10 more for something else. We had not created a budget. We had not paid any taxes. We didn't own a vacuum cleaner. And here Sally was just giving our money away. And I said, why did you do that? And she said, 
She was envious of her parents. Her parents always gave generously to the church, and she expected that we, as a young couple, would do the same. Well, I was wise beyond my years, and I did not argue with her. (laughs) And at the end of the month, we still had some money in the bank. We had paid our taxes, we had bought a vacuum cleaner, and we still had money in the bank. When we find something that we envy about someone else, maybe what we need to do is say, help me follow in your footsteps to find the comfort, the wisdom that you have. It may change my life. To wrap it up, envy blinds us. It blinds us to the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. Envy blinds us to the blessings God has bestowed upon other people. Maybe the point of all this is not to lose our sight, but to gain our sight. To open our eyes. To see the many ways in which God has enriched us that we sometimes take for granted. That we open our eyes and see the ways that God has blessed other people that they may not even see in their own lives. And if we do so, if we keep our eyes open, if we keep trying to imitate the people who seem to be going in the right direction, at the end of the day, our eyes will not be sewn shut for eternity, but our eyes will be open, and we will see God face to face. Our final hymn this morning